Hello again and welcome. We're going to start the second video here. We've uh, we spent the first video just going around the table, taking a look at some cards, the, the basic setup of the scenario that we're going to be playing. The scenario we are playing, as just as a reminder, is scenario one of the core set's main campaign, Knight of the Zealot. Chapter one, The Gathering. There is some flavor text associated with the first scenario to set it all up, but I do not have a copy of the campaign guide. Um, so our flavor text is going to come from the cards themselves. We're going to be playing through the game with the starter deck as advised in the Learn to Play booklet. Let's uh, get started with some flavor. So we are Roland Banks, an investigator getting on in years, and we are trapped in our study. Strange things have been occurring. Um, we're at home in our study, and suddenly some strange things occur, and as the flavor text reads, as you leap to investigate, the door to your study vanishes before your eyes, leaving behind only solid wall. You're trapped inside your study until you can find another way out. As we described at the end of the previous video, our current objective then is represented by that number two in the bottom middle of this card. We need to gain and spend two clues for us to progress from Act 1A to Act 2A. So how are we going to do that? We are going to take our investigator token. In the core set, in the actual box, you're going to have these um, pieces of cardboard here and they have a coloured side and a grey side representing whether it is your turn or whether you have exhausted all your actions. Um, I've grabbed these little player pieces from another tabletop simulator upload. I think it was Arkham Horror. Um, so this is a little Roland Banks icon and I've coloured him blue. We're going to take this, we're going to pop it on this card. Um, you will note, or you, you won't note just yet because I'm not showing you, but note that these cards are double-sided. This is the unexplored side of the card. I forget what the actual game term is, but when you populate rooms um, around you, there will be this uh, default side, and then once you flip them, <laughs> Roland, what are you doing? They will have more information. As you enter a room, you learn various details. So, Roland is in his study, and there are some values on the card here. We have a number in black over here and a number to the other side with the little investigator symbol. What this means, first of all, is that this number here represents how many clues are at this location. Because we are only playing a one player game with one investigator, we only multiply this value by the one, so we have two clues. If it was a two player game, there would be four clues here and so on. This value over here is called the shroud value and represents how difficult it is in this location to discover the clues. So that may be something as simple as how dark the room is. A dark location is going to have a higher shroud value because it's more difficult to see. And there may be other reasons within the scenario that this is high or low. But as it stands, this room has two clues. We need to investigate this room to obtain these two clues and spend them so that we can advance the trapped act. To get started then, we need to draw some cards. You start with five resources and you start with a hand of five cards. Your starting hand cannot include um, a weakness. There are two weaknesses in here. The basic weakness, paranoia, and our unique weakness. If we do draw the unique weakness for Roland, I will just spend a moment talking about that because it's quite unique-ish. It's unique-ish. It's, it's worth spending a moment with. Um, especially if you're just playing a single scenario. Um, but again, I'll, I'll go into that if the situation pops up. So we're going to draw five cards, and we'll see what we have. We start with a magnifying glass, which is an item, or an asset, as the game calls them. Uh, this is something that starts in our hand, and we would have to pay a cost of one in the top left there to put it into our play area, which we uh, then means that we can use it. What does it do? It gives us a plus one um, to our intellect while investigating. We investigate to gain clues, so this is very useful. A plus one is huge, essentially. 
and it also has the fast keyword. You can play the fast cards without spending an action. If you recall from the previous video I said we have three actions per turn. This will not use up one of those actions. It will still cost one resource, but it won't use up one of our valuable actions. All of these cards, all, maybe all, I think all, have these all these symbols below the cost here. You can see it says one asset and then it has a little book symbol at the side. The cards are dual purpose once they're in your hand, not once they're in a the play area. If they're in your hand, you can either spend resources to play them or you can just discard the cards to modify skill tests. So magnifying glass, for example, we can spend one resource, put it into our play area, and then we have a constant plus one to our um, intellect when investigating. Or if I had a book skill check that I was undertaking, I could just discard this card from my hand instead of playing it for free. And I would get a plus one from the book icon up there. And you'll see the other cards have different icons and some of them have multiple. We also have a knife. So this is nice. This is for gaining clues, very important. This is a weapon, also very important. Now, very important um, later on, hopefully not so much early on, but definitely nice to have one available. And we have some special rules for the knife there. It uh, Once it's equipped, we get a base plus one to our combat value. And we can also discard the knife after we've played it and um, do a fight action and we actually get plus two and it deals plus one damage but we obviously lose the item um, as discard would imply. We have guts. This is not an asset, this is just a skill check. You'll see uh, a skill card. It does not have a cost, you don't pay resources to play this, but you only have a limited number of them in your deck. And you can see underneath the skill in the top left it has two willpower um, icons. Sorry, <laughs> forgot the word icons there for a second. So this would be a full plus two to our skill check. Very useful, assuming we come up uh, with a situation that requires us to pass a willpower check. Had some special rules, as these skill cards typically do. You can only commit one of these cards per skill test. Um, perhaps I forget what's actually in this deck. Maybe I had two copies of this card in my deck. I couldn't play both for one skill check. And if the test is successful, it replaces itself and we draw another card immediately to our hand. We have an event card. So this isn't an asset, it's not going to be a permanent thing that we play into our play area and keep, um, but it does cost resources. We would pay one resource and this um, beneficial event would occur. Mind over matter, it's again fast so it doesn't cost an action. We can only play this during our turn, which matters not a lot in a solo game, but would matter if you're playing with other people or with a solo game with other investigators. And the benefit it gives us is, until the end of the round, you can use your intellect in place of combat and agility. Our intellect is three, our combat is four, our agility is two. So perhaps this would be useful if we wanted to use agility um, for some kind of... If, if, we were, if we had to make an agility check, but our agility was a bit crappy and we really needed to um, increase it. Um, it also has the modifier icons, so it can also just be played from hand as a discard for one strength or one agility. Um, I'm not sure about this, I may get rid of this one. And then we have another weapon, we have our automatic. It's a pricey weapon, costs four resources, and it actually has the uses keyword. Um, what we would do if we played this is we would put, we would spend four resources, that money would be gone and we would place four resource tokens near to this card representing ammo. Every time we use it, we would discard one of those resource tokens. It's just a way to track uses. And then we get the benefits um, each time we use it. So we can only use it four times. I'm hoping that we wouldn't need to use it any more than four times. If we do, we're in trouble. Um, right now, I think, I'm unsure. I only want to keep one of these weapons. And I think I'm going to keep the automatic. At the start of the game, once you've drawn your initial five, you get to mulligan out as many cards as you like, replace them, and then that is your starting hand. I'm going to get rid of the knife, and I'm going to get rid of gut, uh, mind over matter, and I'm going to keep guts, I'm going to keep the magnifying glass, and I'm going to keep the automatic. 
I'm going to draw two more cards and place these back in my deck. So what did we draw? We drew another zero cost event called Barricade. Um, a versatile card this, it's free to play, it has three skill modifier icons in the top corner there and it's very useful if we find ourselves in a specific situation as an event. If we find ourselves in a particular room and in adjacent rooms there are many enemies we may want to barricade the room we're in so that the other enemies cannot move towards us. It's The actual event text is um, very specific I think but it's um, versatile in that we can always just spend it for those skill modifier icons or discard it rather. And then we have um, a nice zero cost event that just flat out gives us three resources. We're spending one action and getting three resources. Um, very useful in a pinch or very useful if we're not sure what to spend an action on. We can't really go wrong with just getting three resources. Always going to be good. So this is our starting hand. We are in our location and we are pretty much ready to begin. Let's take a quick look at the round sequence. A typical turn in the game starts off with the mythos phase, then it moves on to the investigation phase, the enemy phase, and the upkeep phase, the cleaning phase. You skip mythos for the first turn. The first turn is basically just going to be an investigation phase and an upkeep phase. It's very unlikely that we'll have an enemy phase. Well, actually, it's impossible that we'll have an, an enemy phase in this scenario. However, if a scenario begins with enemies on the board, then perhaps we would have an enemy phase. Mythos phase would involve drawing a card, uh, advancing the doom, etc. But we don't have to worry about that until the beginning of the next turn. So we can jump straight into our investigation phase, where we take three actions. If there are enemies on the table, then they um, process during the enemy phase. Hopefully there won't be, there shouldn't be. I can't think of a way there would be. And then we do upkeep, which is just resetting our actions, drawing another card, draw one more resource, and any other cleanup bits before the next turn begins. So with that in mind, do we want to spend this initial moment pulling our gun out of our pockets, grabbing our magnifying glass, etc.? I think as a fast action, there is nothing stopping us from putting the magnifying glass in. I think it's well worth the one resource. So we spend a resource and equip our magnifying glass and it's fast so it does not cost an action. Then for our first action we shall investigate the room. If we take a look at Roland he has an intellect of three, the books symbol. The room has a shroud value of two and we have a plus one here. So because we're investigating, we have a, val a skill value of four and we have to beat a value of two in order to gain one clue. So let's go over to the chaos bag and we will draw out a token and see what we get. So we have drawn a minus two. If you remember our skill value was four, the shroud value was two, four minus two is two and we have succeeded the test. We can take a clue. Let's now we have options of again we could maybe equip the the weapon now, which might not be a terrible idea, but it is expensive. I think we wait to equip it just for now. No, actually, no. What we will do, we're going to spend the next action investigating. If we succeed, we'll then equip the weapon. If we fail, maybe we'll investigate again. We'll try to get these clues out of the way first of all. What I would like to do is get out of the study. Or maybe I want to hang around the study. Hmm. There are there's strategies there involved. Um, I should point out also, as we play through here, the first time you play, you're not going to know what to expect in the act cards and the agenda cards. But once you've played it once, once you've played it five times, a dozen times, you are going to <laughs> be intimately familiar with the various uh, requirements uh, that are demanded of you and the various nastiness that is going to befall you. Um, so I have in my mind, I know what's going to happen when I advance this and 
that's all part of the game, I think. Um, so I am aware that if I stay in the study, for example, and an enemy pops up here, I don't actually have to worry about it so much because I can get rid of it just by advancing the act. So I would like to have these clues to hand, which is a long-winded way to state that I'm going to investigate a game. Same as last time, we have a value of a modified value of four and a difficulty of two. So let's go over here, juggle, shuffle rather, and we have a minus one, which is a pass. So we have both clues, and that was my second action. Now, you will note, um, I hope, or you'll remember that I said the advancement of these acts class is classed as a free action that you can do at any time. We are in the middle of my turn here. We've taken two actions. We have one action left. Um, because there is no specific objective text on here, I can spend these two clues right now and advance the um, agenda. Uh, the act, I'm sorry. And I think I will do that. I don't see any reason. I want to be as fast as possible. That's going to be my, my overall strategy here. So we have some flavor text. You notice that the edges of your newly purchased rug are tattered and mud-stained. Finding this odd, you shift the furniture aside and pull back the rug. To your surprise, you see the door leading out of your study. You slowly turn the knob and the door swings open, revealing your hallway below. You jump through the doorway, landing on your feet on soft dirt. The door to the study slams shut above you. The smell of burning wood fills the narrow hall, intermingled with the scent of rot and decay. So what do we need to do? We put into play the hallway, cellar, attic and parlour. They are some of the cards that were put to one side as defined by the scenario. Uh, we are going to discard each enemy in the study automatically. And there's no tests there, it's just if there are baddies in the study they are now no more, they are gone. And then we're going to place investigators in the hallway and remove the study from the game. So let's set that up. We can remove the study from the game, and we want the hallway. We don't need you yet, so I believe it is these four cards. This is going to be the hallway, the attic, the cellar, and the parlour. Let's place the hallway over here. Let's place the parlour over here. The cellar can go a little bit down and the attic can go a little bit up. So this is our house, essentially. We are in a hallway. The hallway, if you see at the bottom, there are three symbols there. A blue triangle, a red cross, a green diamond. Each of these cards has one of those symbols in the top left, representing the hallway is connected to each of these directly. So you can travel from the hallway to the attic, the hallway to the parlor, and so on and so forth. You cannot travel from the attic to the cellar. You have to go through the hallway first. We are in the hallway, and as I mentioned before, because we are now in this location, we can flip it and see what is happening. A little bit of flavor text. The walls of your house are splattered with mud, and your hardwood floor is gone, replaced with a dirt path. You will note here there are no clues in the hallway, but it still has a shroud value of one, which can be uh, important for various uh, effects. Let's go up to the card. Just make sure we've done everything that we needed to do. We have put into play the hallway, cellar, attic and parlor. We've discarded the study. We've placed Roland in the hallway. All good. Act 1A. Done. Act 2. The barrier. A glowing barrier blocks the path to your parlor. As you move toward it, intense heat forces you to back away. Picking up a handful of dirt, you toss it at the barrier and watch in horror as the dirt incinerates. Perhaps there's something in the cellar or attic that can help. Here you can see we do not just have the base clue value in the bottom middle, we have a specific objective. Objective. When the round ends, investigators in the hallway may as a group spend the requisite number of clues to advance. So it is similar to the previous objective, except that where, as in the previous one, we could spend those two clues wherever we were, whenever we wanted. Here, we can only spend them in the hallway, 
and we have to do it at the end of a round. We cannot do it mid-action. And we need a value of 3 for this one. So, our objective as it stands is to get 3 clues and return to the hallway. Where are those clues going to be? Well, the flavour text indicates that they may be in the attic and or the cellar. We still have one action left from our first turn. We're still on the first turn, believe it or not. Um, what shall we do with this first turn? I would like a flashlight before I head to the cellar. I, a little hint here, the cellar is going to be dark, and I would like a flashlight before I head down there. So, I could either, right now, move from the hallway to the attic, or I could spend this final action equipping a weapon. What I don't want to do is find myself facing a monster without my weapon equipped. I would have to spend an action to equip that weapon, which would give the monster um, an opportunity attack against me. With that in mind, and because we are going to be drawing a card from the encounter deck very shortly, I'm actually going to blow all of my cash that I have left. I was going to delete them. I won't delete them. I'll just place them over here, but I have spent them. They're no longer in my pool. And I'm going to equip my 45 automatic. And then, as we noted earlier, um, it has four ammo. So that's why I didn't actually just delete them. We can actually use these four resources as ammunition. And that was our final action. We would go to the enemy phase, but there are no enemies on the table, so we skip it. And then we go to the cleanup phase. Let's refresh our actions. Let's draw one resource and draw one card. Oh dear. So before we move on <laughs> to turn two, let's take a look at Roland's unique bad card. His is a weakness. What does it say? Put cover up into play in your threat area with three clues on it. Let's do that right now. So our threat area is here in front of us, and then let's just scoot these cards up a little bit. Perfect. Okay. Let's take a look at this card. Put cover up into play in your threat area with three clues on it. I'll do that in a second. As a reaction trigger, when you would discover one or more clues at your location, discard that many clues from cover up instead. And then there is a forced text at the bottom. When the game ends, if there are any clues on cover up, you suffer one mental trauma. So, Let's imagine a situation where you as the player are just playing one scenario. You're not playing a campaign, you're just playing a single scenario. This actually doesn't do anything that terrible to you. It has no impact on the scenario at hand. However, if you don't deal with it during your scenario, it is going to negatively impact permanently every other scenario that follows. You see it mentions you suffer one mental trauma. That would mean that you would start each a subsequent scenario already at one sanity damage. With that in mind, um, and to make things a little bit more interesting, let's assume for the purposes of this card that I am playing a campaign, just to give this a, bit, a little bit of weight, otherwise I would just ignore it. So I'm going to try during the scenario to get rid of this. I don't want to end the game with this still in play. So it wants three clues placed on it. And what this is essentially doing is it is just slowing me down, sadly. It is better that this pops up early, if it's going to pop up in your scenario, you want it to pop up earlier rather than later, because at least now I have all the clues available in the game pretty much for me to deal with this. But it is going to take three extra investigations for me to get rid of these three clues, because instead of investigating a clue here, for example, I'm going to investigate the clue, but remove one of these instead. So then, that was our drawn card at the end of the turn one, at the, uh, during the cleanup phase. I, was, <laughs> I don't mind saying I was hoping for something a little bit more useful going into turn two, but um, welcome to 
Cthulhu Mythos games, I suppose. <laughs> they are not going to be friendly and hold your hand. Oh, one thing I didn't do. I spent these clues. There we go. We need to get rid of those. I no longer have those. Those were spent to progress the act. Um, we are set up then. We can start turn one. So, as we saw, we now have a Mythos phase. There are three steps in the Mythos phase. First is we increment the Doom Tracker by one. Then we're going to check whether the Doom Tracker matches the specified value on the agenda card. And then we're going to draw an encounter card and deal with it. First thing first then, number one. This is a three, so we're not at three yet, so we uh, don't need to worry about this. Let's head over here and see what the encounter deck has for us. Great, we have an enemy. So let's take a look at an enemy card. We have the enemy's name at the top and then three numbers. The first three with the red fist on the left represents the enemy's combat value. That is the um, skill check difficulty, essentially. The middle value here, also three, <laughs> is the monster's health. It's how much damage we need to do to it. And the final green value, three, is its, I guess it would correspond to the enemy's awareness. It is the agility check difficulty that we would be testing against. It has some traits, it's a humanoid, it's a monster, and it is a ghoul. For this scenario specifically, any ghoul-type monsters are going to potentially have um, a pretty ugly impact on our uh, endeavors. And it has some special text, Prey, Lowest Remaining Health. You can see in the very middle of the card there, it has uh, the enemy type, and then it has one red symbol to the left, and one blue symbol to the right. That represents the actual damage that it does when it attacks. It will do one health damage and one sanity damage. Prey indicates that it targets the investigator with the lowest remaining health. In a solo game, that doesn't actually matter too much, as uh, I'm the only person around. So, let us place the ghoul also in our threat area. Place him down here. So this is the state of the game when we begin turn two, or after the mythos phase of turn two. We have our three actions. We can use these to deal with this. If we don't deal with this after these three actions are through, then we have the enemy phase and the monster will deal damage to us. So typically the encounter deck is going to populate the board with monsters. They are immediately going to engage you because note, we are we're in the room here the monster enters the room and as a rule it is generally going to just jump on you immediately. There are ways to exhaust the enemies so that they do not um, act. For example, I could spend um, an action evading this monster. We would then tap the monster, move it back here and it would not be able to do anything in the enemy phase. That isn't necessarily the best play for Roland because, as we noted, he has a combat of four, good at fighting, an agility of two less good um, at evading. So we have these three actions. Do we just carry on? Do we move around? No, is the question there. We're not going to move around. Monsters will follow you. This is in my threat area until I get rid of it. If I move locations, it stays in my threat area. It just comes right along with me. So, as luck would have it, we equipped our pistol. Hmm. So, I guess, first action uh, a quick word about attacks of opportunity as well. Um, if I try to do anything, pretty much anything, with some exceptions that I'll go into, it gets an attack of opportunity. If I try to equip something now, it would do one health, one sanity damage. If I try to gain a resource, draw another card as an action, it would do that damage. The only actions that you can do when an enemy is in your threat area is a fight action, an evasion action, and what's called a parley action, which is very specific and scenario um, type deal that we might come across later. So I'm going to spend my first action and use this fight. You see the arrow on this card? That represents one of my actions. Um, I spend an ammo and do the fight action. I get plus one combat for this attack and it deals plus one damage. So Let's take a look at our values. We have a combat of four. We have a combat value of five, because we have the pistol. And this has a, a combat value of three. So we are two above. 
So let's go over to our chaos bag and hope that we don't hit a minus three or worse. I'm feeling really bad now that I said that. I'm feeling just like the rain clouds of jinx right above my head. Let's pull a token. There we go. <laughs> Called it. So we have the minus three there. Ah, uh, so we failed. Um, it's n not necessarily a problem. It doesn't do anything poorly for us um, at this point. We just used up an action and one ammo, and we did not um, successfully attack it. We need to do it again. We're going to spend another ammo, and we're going to go back over to the chaos bag. And this time, we're not going to pull a minus three. We're going to pull a minus one. Okay, so that is successful. Um, attack in this game deals one damage at a base value. All attacks deal one damage. So when you see cards such as this that say plus one damage, then you're talking about this attack actually deals two damage. This is a really annoying value for health, it being three, because um, we need to attack it twice to actually get rid of it. But that said, we have dealt two damage to this slimy bugger. And as loath as I am to spend an entire turn dealing with this ghoul and not making any progress, we have to get rid of it. So, ha, ha, wait, 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 wait. I just thought of something. Let's take a look at Roland's card here. After you defeat an enemy, discover one clue at your location. Limit once per round. Can you see where I'm going with this? For my final action, I am going to move to the cellar. The ravenous ghoul has followed me to the cellar now. He is in the cellar with me. We're in the cellar, and let's do this in the correct order. So I moved. Um, before I actually moved from here, I would say I'm going to move and then I would actually take the attack of opportunity. So if we're doing this in the absolute correct scientific order, I would have taken the one health damage and the one sanity damage. Then I would have moved my player over here. Let's read the seller's rules. Uh, we'll go into the numbers in a second. Uh, you can see it has a forced rule text there. After you enter the cellar, take one damage. So we're going to take an extra damage just for entering into the cellar. A little bit noxious in there. Maybe I uh, banged my head on a, a beam above my head. Maybe I got a splinter or something um, in my rush to get away from the, the slime ball. But anyway, this is our current situation. We've used all three actions. We have moved into the cellar and the ravenous ghoul has followed us. Let's take a look at what the cellar does. It has a shroud value of four. I think I mentioned that it's dark down here, so it's more difficult to investigate and look for clues. And I don't have my flashlight, which reduces shroud by two. Um, however, it does have a number of clues in here. There are two clues in the cellar. Let's pop that back in the bag. So let's take clue, two clues, two clue, 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 <laughs> two, two clues. Uh, you know what I mean. There are now two clues in the cellar, and hopefully next turn I can defeat the ghoul, and I'll get one of these clues for free using Roland's special action, and I can. Um, that will be useful. However, what that does mean, I am essentially getting that clue for free later on, but I took one damage, one sanity, and one horror damage for moving, and I'm also now, because we are now in the whoops, enemy phase, I'm going to take an additional one damage and one sanity damage. So whether this is a smart play or not, who knows, but it's the play that I've made. So that was the enemy phase, it attacked me stays engaged with me, and we move into the cleanup. We get our actions back, we gain another resource, and we gain another card. What have we drawn? This is dodge. Fast. Play when an enemy attacks an investigator at your location, and cancel that attack. So it's a nice little one-cost event. Should we uh, be in a position where we're going to take fatal damage, for example, we can uh, throw this out. Uh, we have the willpower icon and agility icon there also at a pinch. 
So we drew our resource, we drew our extra card, we reset our actions, we're now on to turn three. Let's bump our doom track up. We're still not at three yet. And let's draw a new card. Ancient Evils. As a revelation, which is basically an instant effect, as an immediate event, we are going <laughs> the funny story. I cannot actually remember. It is at least three times. This exact card has popped up at this exact moment. Um, where on turn two or three or whatever it, we're at, one away from this advancing, you draw this and let's just read through it. Place one doom on the current agenda. This effect can cause the current agenda to advance. This card pops out at this point and causes this to immediately advance. So what happens when the agenda advances. I didn't actually read this flavor text, did I? I'll let you read that for yourself. Let's just assume I did. It sets the stage for the um, me being in my study in the house and some weird crap happening. So the agenda has advanced. Let's see what happens on the back. Your house continues to change before your very eyes. The walls have decayed and the ground in many rooms has turned to dirt. It is almost as if you have been transported somewhere else entirely, although every now and again you recognize elements of your former home. What happens? The lead investigator must decide. Either each investigator discards one card at random from their hand, or the lead investigator takes two horror. Um, lead investigator would be relevant were there more than one investigator, as it's just a solo investigator, the lead keyword there is not necessary. So we have to choose between taking two horror or discarding one random card. Um, taking a look at our situation, I think it's obvious what I'm going to do. I am not about to throw another two horror on this at all. So we are going to discard one of these cards. Let's grab a d6. And we have a one. So we're getting rid of guts. Goodbye guts. Goodbye dice. Okay, so that was the event there. So should we take a look at the next agenda? Rise of the ghouls. The floor beneath you is giving way and you see a vast network of tunnels twisting into the darkness below. Shapes and silhouettes of strange creatures move swiftly through the tunnels trying to find a way up. You probably don't want to be here when they do. Now, whereas the previous one had a value of three, this one has um, a much nicer, although <laughs> not exactly comfortable, value of seven. We can reset the Doom Tracker, and now we have seven turns, we hope, assuming no more of those pop up. Um, let's do that the other way around, actually. Uh, assuming no more of these pop up, um, we have seven turns to make our way. I will say, right now, I do not want this act to advance. Um, well, maybe it's not so bad, depending on the play state of the board. If there are a bunch of ghouls floating around, this gets very ugly very fast if we allow this to advance. So, what is our situation at the start of... I've already lost track of the turn. Is it turn three or turn four? Um, it does not matter, is what it is. What it is. We're going to spend an action fighting this ghoul. So, nothing's changed in terms of values. We have a modified combat value of 5, it has a combat value of 3. Let's head over here, give the bag a shake. Right then, so we have drawn the skull icon. Um, if you do not recall, actually I don't think I showed this at the start of this video, I showed this at the end of the last video, which is perhaps poor of me. So what does the skull icon do for the gathering on standard difficulty? It corresponds to a modified value of minus x, where x is the number of ghoul enemies at your location. There is a ghoul at our location, so this is minus 1. Minus 1 is not enough to cause us to fail, and we deal 2 damage. Let me spend another bullet, however. Those bullets went a lot faster than I was hoping, I, I, I don't mind saying. So we have defeated this. One thing to note for enemies, you do want to look at these and see if there is a victory point on them. Sadly, Ravenous Ghoul does not have a victory point. Victory points are used between scenarios to upgrade your deck. They correspond to experience points, I guess, from an RPG sense. Where am I going? 
So our first action was to, to kill the ghoul, and I did not forget, thankfully. If you note the special rule, after you defeat an enemy, discover one clue at your location. Uh, that does not cost an action, it is just a reaction trigger. So because something happened, I defeated an enemy, I can automatically discover a clue. Because I don't have my flashlight in hand, I am not going to stick around in the cellar. My second action is going to be to move over to the hallway. My third action, I was going to say, is to move to the attic. And perhaps I will do that. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Yes, it is. I'm going to move to the attic as my third action. Reason being, I will probably be spending a while in the attic trying to also clear this cover-up card. Um, this could get very ugly very fast, I don't mind saying, especially with how much damage we took there. Which is on me, I made some decisions which I may um, not survive to regret, so to speak. We've taken our three actions, there are no enemies on the board. We may move on to the cleanup phase. Let's get our actions back. Let's get another resource. Let's draw another card. What did we pull? We pulled that Mind Over Matter card, which I don't consider to be a very strong card, um, personally. It's a shame we drew that. Oh, there are much better cards that I would have liked to have seen there. But it is what it is. Let us move on to the next turn. Mythos phase. Plus one to the agenda. It is not at seven. Let's head over here and see what awfulness awaits. Another creature? Who would have thought? <coughs> so we have a swarm of rats. It is a hunter, which means it actually follows you around. If it spawns somewhere where an investigator is not, it is going to follow you. Uh, if you move to another room, it's going to if you manage to evade it, for example, so it could not follow you, you went to a different location, it is still going to travel. Uh, that won't be a problem, because I think we're just going to kill it. It only has one health, it has a combat value of one. It is essentially an annoyance which is going to eat up one of our actions. However, for Roland, given his special ability, it's actually rather sweet. So, that was the Mythos phase. Let's. Um, spend an action to fight this rat. I am not going to use my pistol. Thinking about it, because the ghoul had three health and I'd already done two, perhaps I should not have used the pistol to take that last health. Um, if I just punch it with my, or give it a good kick, I would do one damage. Uh, I don't, I didn't, for the ghoul, I did not need that plus one damage to defeat it. Um, I'm certainly not gonna waste ammo on such a weak enemy um, as this. So we're just going to make a basic combat check using our standard uh, value here. Um, strength of 4. Swarm of Rats has a difficulty of 1. So what we don't want to see here is the minus 4 token, and we don't want to see the um, tentacles token. And I really shouldn't be saying this every time I draw from the, the bag because it is just classic jinxing uh, strategies. Uh, we have the minus 3 which is fine. <laughs> minus three is okay this time. Minus three does not uh, kick us in the nuts. We have strength of four. Minus three brings us to one, which is still enough to defeat the rats. The rats go into the discard pile, and because of Roland's special ability... Oh, I forgot to. Forgive me. When we moved in here, we should have um, shown the attic and populated it with clues. You can see it has two clues attached to it. You can see that it has some forced text. After you enter the attic, take one horror. I'm in really bad shape for horror. And it has a shroud value of one. It's quite well lit up here. You can see quite well. Investigating isn't going to be so difficult. So that was action one. We obtained a clue for defeating the enemy. So we have two clues now. We need three clues to um, advance the act, but I do want to try and deal with cover-up. Perhaps, I mean, in a scenario, you can ignore this, and 
if things are going poorly, you just take that mental trauma into the next scenario. Chances are you're going to be taking things like that anyway. It's not always going to go swell. So at this point, given we have two actions here, we could just investigate and we could maybe make an executive decision. My sanity damage is too high right now. I cannot waste three investigations um, fixing this problem and I should just endeavor to finish the scenario as quickly as possible before more horror damage accrues and I go insane and have to forfeit. Um, you don't lose in this game, there, are, there is not necessarily any loss state. You would just go into scenario two with a bad result and the story would change to reflect that. So I don't actually know. This is a tricky choice, I don't mind saying. Do we try to get rid of this cover-up or do we move on? I think we will. <laughs> I mean, we're not doing too bad in terms of time, it is just this situation. I could maybe, there is a, I believe there is something in here, a first aid kit which would allow me to heal up sanity. But no, I am going to try to get rid of cover up. Let's play it that way. So, action number two. I'm going to investigate with my intellect of three. I am investigating, so I get this plus one. Oh, one thing I should also note, I don't think I touched on this at all. At the bottom right hand corner of these cards, there are, some of them have symbols. You'll see that both of these have a hand symbol. That is an inventory limit, essentially. I cannot hold more than two hand symbol cards because as a humanoid, <laughs> I only have two hands. Um, so it's just worth noting that were I to draw, do I have any here? No, none of these are assets that have the hand symbol, but I could not equip a third hand symbol. So as my second action, I'm going to investigate using my intellect of modified intellect of four against the shroud value of one. So only a minus four and the tentacles messes up with us. Uh, this is the broken runestone. <coughs> uh, I don't know if you remember, but this is a minus two in this scenario and it inflicts one physical damage if there's a ghoul at our location. So that's a pass. Instead of taking this clue, I'm going to delete this clue. Third action, same thing again. And that is a cultist. It is a minus one, and if we fail, we take one horror. Again, that is a pass. So we can get, take this clue, but we're not going to. We're going to remove a clue from the weakness. That is the end of our turn. No enemies in play. So we move into the cleanup phase. Regain our actions. Let's gain another resource. Let's draw a card. Ah, look at that. First aid, cost two, asset. It will have three uses on it, and as an action, we can heal a damage or heal an, a horror. Um, if you're playing a multiplayer game, you can actually use this as a support card. You can heal other investigators, not just yourself. So that's kind of a perfect, because um, I don't think there's anything here that is just an immediate heal. Um, it's a little bit slow. We have to spend resources to equip it. That costs an action. Then we have to spend actions to get our sanity back. But I think that will be worth it. That said, Let's move into the next turn and see what happens. Oops. What do we have? Crypt Chill. <coughs> okay. Test Willpower. Um, the four in brackets there represents the difficulty of the test. If you fail, choose and discard one asset you control. If you cannot, take two damage instead. Interesting. Did we have a card? No, we got rid of our guts, didn't we? Or we had to discard it by ran uh, randomly. This does not have willpower icon. This does have willpower icon, but I feel like I want to keep hold of that. And we don't want to spend this willpower icon. We want to actually be equipping this. We could spend barricade. Let's do that. 
let's take the test and we are going to discard this from our hand and we're going to use that single willpower icon up there to modify our uh, roll by plus one. So if we take a look at our card, we have a natural willpower of four. This is actually a terrible idea, thinking about it. Mm. The reason I say that, we have a willpower of four modified. The difficulty is four. So if we take a look at what is in this bag, how many of these tokens actually allows us to succeed? Any negative modifier causes us to fail. We need zeros or plus ones. So we have uh, one, two, three, four for the elder sign, and then these skulls would actually count as a zero modifier also because there are no ghouls. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six out of 16. What's that like? Um, just under 40% perhaps? That's not actually too bad. That's better than I was expecting. So let's make the test. We do not want any negative modifier. Any negative modifier, we fail. <gasps> well, you look at that. We have zero. Fantastic. So we passed the test. Lovely jubbly. Um, if we had failed, again, just as a reminder, we would have had to either discard an asset. I was thinking maybe I would discard the magnifying glass. Uh, since we're in such a low shroud value anyway, it's not too difficult, these investigation tests. <coughs> Um, or maybe because I'm just so, I have so much health. Uh, no, I have nine, three. It w I would have had to make a decision there whether to take the health hit or to discard the magnifying glass. As it is, we didn't need to because we passed our test. We can move into our next actions. Let's carry on as we were. First action, we're going to investigate here. That is a minus two. The modified value is... <laughs> I know we've passed, I just wanted to make sure I have my numbers right. Modified intellect value for investigation is 4, difficulty of 1, so even at a minus 3 we would have passed. So do we take the clue? No we do not. We are going to delete that. We no longer have to worry about cover up, but we do have to worry about surviving the scenario. Second action, what do we want to do here? We want to grab the clue. But do we want to spend those clues this turn? Am I ready for what comes in the next card? Actually, we can't because we need to be in the hallway. So we cannot investigate the final clue and move into the hallway. So it's impossible to accomplish the act progression this turn. It would have to be next turn anyway. I actually think I am going to spend my... Last action, equipping this. The reason I am equipping this is maybe we spawn another weak enemy like rats. I can actually kill the rats and gain that clue that way. It's an alternate way to gain it. So if we take another look at first aid, um, we want to spend two assets to equip it. And then we want to be putting three uses on the first aid. Let's place these above actually, a little bit clearer. Okay, and then in further turns as actions I can spend these to heal up, and try and just calm down, yeah? Um, so yes, that was all three of my actions. Again, no enemies in play, so we don't need to worry about the enemy phase. We will do cleanup. We will gain another resource. We will gain another card. And we have Roland's special 38. Similar to the pistol that we already have. Spend one ammo. Fight, you get plus one for this attack. If there are one or more clues on your location, you get plus three instead. So that's, um, if we can be in the location with clues, that actually makes us do, it makes it very easy for us to succeed, or easier, shall we say. Uh, this attack deals plus one damage. That's interesting. Only cost three to equip. Are you sure? Right then, let's uh, go into the next turn. Advance the agenda. Let's draw another encounter card. We have 
as luck would have it, another swarm of rats. And this is going quite well, actually. This is a, a perfect card for me, as far as I'm concerned. So the swarm of rats spawn in the uh, attic, and they go into our threat area, and we begin our new turn. Let's begin by attacking the swarm of rats. I am actually going to... Hmm. What are the actual numbers here? If we just do a base fight, we have strength of 4, difficulty there, so a minus 4. If we drew the minus 4, we would fail. It's a tiny chance. Uh, minus 4 or the um, tentacles token, so it's a 1 in 8 chance. 2 out of those 16 tokens would constitute a fail. Um, let's change that 2 out of 16 to a 1 out of 16. I'm going to spend my final um, uh, bullet in the uh, pistol here to attack to get the plus one. Um, and what that means is even if I draw minus four, I, I still am successful. The reason I'm happy to get rid of this is I have a better weapon to replace it with now. So let's draw a card and we have cultist. So not a problem. If it had been the red tentacles token, then you know, whatever. Um, as luck would have it, we defeat the rats and as per our special ability, we get that clue. We now have our three clues. Second action. Hmm, 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 hmm. Second and third action, I am going to heal back to sanity. I'm going to take it a little bit slow. I think we're doing okay on the Doom track, and I want to make sure I'm ready for when I advance this act. We will endeavour to advance this act at the end of the next turn, not this turn. So there's our three actions. We're not in the hallway, so we couldn't um, advance it now. The reason I'm not moving into the hallway is, should an enemy spawn on me that isn't a hunter type, it doesn't necessarily follow me, there may be a situation where I want to just evade it and leave the monster in this room. I don't really want the monster to be in the hallway because it's such a central area. Um, so I'm happy to end a turn in one of these adjacent rooms that I don't act, that I'm finished with essentially, um, just on the off chance that there's a monster that I want to just keep over there, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we are in cleanup. Let's get our actions back. Let's get another resource. Let's draw another card. We have hyper awareness. These are very nice cards, um, you play them as an asset and they just sit in your play area and you are then able to spend resources to buff two types of skill check. For this one it is books and agility, both very useful for Roland. He has a poor agility and there are cards, uh, really hostile damaging cards that force you to take agility checks. Um, investigation is obviously important for obtaining clues, which is essentially the main goal in, uh, in your play. So it's a very nice card. At this point it might be a little bit too slow. Um, I don't think I will spend the resources on this. I will probably just try to maybe look for an opportunity to use the skill modifier icons. Again, there are other cards that I would have liked to have seen here, more combat oriented cards. If you hadn't guessed, we might be heading towards a bit of a fight later on. And that is the end of this turn. We move into the next turn. Bump up the Doom. Still not at 7. Let's draw another card. Whoops. What are we looking at? Another Crypt Chill. Oh dear. Um, test. Heads. Willpower. At difficulty 4. If you fail, choose. This is perfect. This is perfect. I do not care if I fail this. I do not care one bit. In fact, I'm not even going to bother making the test. I, I will automatically say that I fail. Um, well, I suppose I shouldn't do that, but I'm certainly not going to modify it. I'm just going to pull a chaos token. It's minus one, so yeah, I do not beat a difficulty four. And I have heads value, willpower of three, um, takes me down to two, doesn't beat the four. The reason I don't care is because this asset that I have, it doesn't automatically disappear. Unless it specifically says in the text, uh, text that it is discarded once the uses are gone and um, you do not automatically discard it. So this 
As long as I read that right, it did say asset, correct? If you fail, choose and discard one asset you control. So I am perfectly happy to just chuck my empty pistol. No problem. Let's go into our investigation phase. Right then, at this point now, I am perfectly happy to move into the hallway. I need to be here for us to advance the act. What can I do for prep? Let's spend three tokens and equip our special pistol. It also has four ammo. That was the second action. And then for a third action, what should I do? I only have one resource. I will get another resource at the end of this turn, so I will go into the next turn with two. What can I do with two? I don't see myself playing that. I don't see myself playing that. Emergency cash and dodge. That could save our life, essentially. What I'm thinking here is for our final action, do we, as an action you can gain a resource, as an action you can just draw a card. Maybe I want to... Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't spend an, an action to draw a card, uh, to draw a resource, I would spend an action to spend emergency cash. So I could draw a card or I could spend emergency cash and get four resources. I don't think I want that though. What I want right now are certain cards from my deck that boost my combat ability. So my third action, I'm going to draw a card. This scraggly old book is not, <laughs> it's absolutely not uh, the combat item that I wanted. It's a very nice book, very very nice, but at this stage in the scenario this is not what I'm looking for. Oh well, not a problem. Um. That is our actions, no enemies on the board. Let's clean up, let's draw another card. Hope something a little better. Working a hunch, lots of yellow cards here. You'll note um, Roland's classes here come from the Guardian pool up here, this dark blue, and these Seeker um, cards down here, these amber, orange, yellows. We're getting lots of these. I would really be preferring to pull some of these. What I'm looking for are Things like Guard Dog, which you can use to get a free um, bit of damage in. Um, something like Dynamite Blast would be nice. I could throw my resource cache at that and do some uh, sick damage. This one especially, Vicious Blow, um, it's a skill modifier and it is going to allow me to do one extra damage, assuming that they're successful. But we didn't draw into them. Um, end of the phase, we have done our actions, we drew our card. We added our resource. We are still in the end of phase, phase, <laughs> end of round phase. Uh, so at this point, we are in a position to. Why do I? Oh, I've got my clues and resource tokens. We're in a position to spend these three clues. Let's head over to our act deck here. We are in the hallway. It is at the end of a round. We can advance this card. What happens? Using the barrel from the attic, you carry ice and snow from the cellar and hurl it at the barrier. The barrier sparks and shudders as it consumes the ice, then hisses and fades out of existence. The barrier blocking passage into the parlour has vanished. Reveal the parlour. Put the set-aside Lita Chandler into play in the parlour and spawn the set-aside Ghoul Priest in the hallway. Well, let's do that, shall we? That is this card and this card. We bring them over here. We have an enemy, the ghoul priest. He is going to spawn in the hallway. I am in the hallway, so he is going to immediately engage me. And then we have Lita here, and she is going to spawn in the parlor. We take a look at Lita here, and she's actually an NPC, I guess. Um, we don't control her. She looks like a card because it is possible to put her into your deck to kind of take control of her, um, but there are rules involved. 
We need to reveal the parlor as advised by the thing. Let's read the parlor first. Um, it has no clues, it has a shroud value of 2, and it has a resign option. It's essentially, I give up, I want to end, I'm going to run out the door. You can do that as an action and it immediately ends the game, and you would have the resign state as you read the campaign information. It has further text, while Cheap Lita Chandler is not controlled by a player, she gains as an action, parley, test, um, intellect of difficulty 4. If you succeed, you then take control of Lita Chandler, and on Lita Chandler's card, She's classed as an ally, and while you control her, so if you successfully pass this, if you control Lita Chandler, she gains both. Each investigator at your location gets plus one strength, and as a reaction trigger, when an investigator at your location successfully attacks a monster, it deals plus one damage. Um, really nice. However, we're just going to fight the monster, the ghoul priest. This is the boss. So let's look at his numbers. Combat value of 4, a health of 5 per investigator, and an agility, uh, a, an awareness value of 4, a difficulty check for an, an evasion check. It's humanoid, monster, it is a ghoul, and it's classed as elite. It preys on highest strength, it is a hunter, so it follows you, and it has retaliate. That means if we ever do any attacks against it, if we fail any attacks, I might be wrong here, I'm not 100%, I actually just second guessed myself. I think it might be any skill checks while it's in your threat area. It's either any skill checks while it's in your threat area or an, specifically an attack against it. Essentially, if you fail those tests, it immediately attacks you as an attack of opportunity. And we can see here it has two um, physical damage and two sanity damage. So we don't want, want to get hit by this too many times. And it has five health. Let's see what we can do. This was sadly just the end of the round. We have not started the next turn. So shall we do that? I think we must. So there's a situation going into this, what I hope will be the final turn. Oh, we have a new act. What have you done? A woman with a torch stands in your parlor, a glimmer of hatred in her eyes. What have you done to my barrier? She screams, furious. Before you can answer, a ghastly wail sounds behind you, and a creature wearing robes and a deer skull mask tears through the wall, advancing towards you. And our objective now is just to kill the ghoul priest. So, let's um, start the new turn. Advance Doom. We'll pull a card. We have a treachery, grasping hands. As a revelation, we want to test agility, difficulty 3, and for each point we fail, we take 1 damage. So, what do we have that we can discard for agility tests? We're going to keep dodge. We will discard this. Uh, we will discard this. And we don't have any other agility pips. So we have plus 2 here. We have an agility value of 2 as a base, so we have a modified value of 4. Let's pull a token. 4 minus 2 is 2, and this was versus difficulty 3. So for each point you fail, we take one damage. Um, we scored two, it's three, we failed by one, so we take one damage. Add another wound to our sorry corp, sorry body, not corpse, not yet. Um, that was the mythos phase, so now we move into the actions. Can we beat up on this ghoul before it kills us? We've got our trusty weapon equipped. Um, yeah, I think we just have to roll some tokens now, see what happens. We don't have anything we can commit for combat buffs. We have an option here, there is one option we could take. We could move into the cellar and take two damage. Maybe we do that. You know what? To, for an exciting ending, we are going to do that, and I will explain why. This might be the worst idea possible, but we are going to, well, as we decide to move, this will do an attack of opportunity against us. We're going to take two damage here, two sanity damage, and it is going to follow us. We are now in the cellar. There is a clue in the cellar. That was action number one. 
we can, as action number two, spend one ammo, and we get plus one attack for this, uh, plus one combat for this attack. But there is a clue here, so we actually get plus three, and it's going to deal plus one damage. So, as action number two, we're going to spend an ammo, and we get plus three for this attack. Our combat value is now seven, and it has a combat value of four. So only the minus four and the tentacles can actually beat us. A minus three and we still are okay. <laughs> oh my god. Well, will you look at that? <clears throat> so that's a fail. That is a fail. That's the minus four that we did not want to see. Um, what this means is I have now lost the game. I wasn't expecting that to happen. Because it now does an attack of opportunity against us. We can use this to avoid it. That cancels that attack. However, in the enemy phase, it will get its attack. I was going to save this for the enemy phase so that this did not do it. And then we got the whole other turn in order to defeat it. However, there's no way we can avoid this now. We play the dodge. It doesn't get its attack of opportunity. We make another attack, I guess. Um, just, just for wanting to's sake. And that's a success, so we would do two damage to it. And we would then move into the enemy phase up here, and it would do its two health damage, which wouldn't have killed us. But this sends us insane, and we are defeated. The scenario immediately ends, and you open up your campaign book and see what happens if you are defeated. I hope you can see how close that kind of was. I had enough actions there to do two damage to it this t uh, to do four damage to it this turn. It would have attacked me in the enemy phase. I would have played dodge to avoid. Where is it? Dodge is somewhere. To avoid there. Dodge to avoid that damage. Assuming we didn't then die in the mythos phase, we had three full actions to finally get the, the last one point of health. As it stands, we lost. So, I hope that was uh, an enjoyable watch. It came right down to the wire. Probably made a few bad decisions, but. Um, the, the, po the point of the game is that, again, there is no loss here. We, um, we have an interesting story to tell, and we can take that with us into scenario number two, the Midnight Mass. Thank you for watching. I will do another video, uh, which should be up shortly, um, covering a custom deck built game. Maybe pick Wendy or someone. Just uh, Maybe I'll roll the dice and do it randomly. I won't be rolling the game. But we'll go through the deck building options here. We'll actually spend five or ten minutes just putting it together a deck, and then we can see how it plays. Again, thank you for watching. Um, yeah, I'll see you soon in the next video. Bye bye.